On behalf of President Couture and also our Provost, Paula Marek Short, I am Antonio Tillis, Dean of the College of Liberal Arts and Social Sciences. I want to first of all thank all of you for taking time out of your afternoons on what looks like might be uh, just an interesting day to uh, give us that type of shower, whether we need it or not, as we leave here going to our cars. But I am extremely excited about this evening's panel discussion uh, for multiple reasons. Number one, it really shows the work that is being done by our amazing Center for Public History under the direction of Dr. Monica Perales. And it also shows the collaboration, the intimate collaboration between the Center for Public History and also the Houston History Magazine, which Dr. Harwell has given so much um, critical care and attention to. When they came to me and wanted to um, think about, when Debbie approached Dr. Harwell, I may, I may say Debbie every now and then, when Dr. Hellware came to me and asked to, uh, to brainstorm about this, I was extremely excited to have the college to assist um, the Center for Public History as well as the Houston uh, History Magazine in the launching of, uh, of Milestones. So that conversation led to bringing two people that I have known for a long time um, in different stages of my academic career. I call them my bookends, <laughs> and that I am between Drs. Alexander and also Dr. Schwaz in the sense that when I was chair of African American Studies at Dartmouth, he and I worked on many dissertation committees together at the University of Massachusetts Elmhurst, where he is, because they didn't have someone who did Afro-Latin America and of course, that is my specialty. And I have known Dr. Alex, well, I'm not gonna talk about how long I've known Dr. Alexander. Yeah, don't but talk about it. Mo <laughs> more importantly, in her capacity with what she did with, the, with ASWAD during her presidency. ASWAD is the Association for the Study of the Worldwide African Diaspora that was started by Michael and really supported by NYU for a long, long time, and NYU still supports as what. Mm -hmm. um, Michael Gomez, sorry, I just said Michael, Dr. Michael Gomez. And so um, under her leadership, the, the organization really thrived and thrived financially. So um, I have that to know, and I've known her since her days at Ohio State as well. But that's not why we're here, it's for me to go down memory lane. So I will <laughs> stop right there and say the third person is one that I've gotten to know since my capacity as dean she is my partner in crime, as she is the dean of the University of Houston downtown campus, and we have been working very well together, and I'm just pleased that Dean Fulton can also join us. So again, I bring you greetings on behalf of the college, on behalf of our provost's office, and also our president's office, and to say to Dr. Shabazz, a coog, welcome home. It's good to have you back. <laughs> Thank you. Wonderful. Well, welcome home. Um, my name is Monica Perales, and I am the director of the Center for Public History. I'm also an associate professor in the Department of History, and I am um, really happy to, to stand before you here and to welcome you all um, and to tell you a little bit about who we are and what we do. At the Center for Public History, our mission is to ignite an understanding of our diverse pasts by collaborating with and training historically-minded students, practitioners, and the public through community-driven programming and scholarship. Since 1984, we have created collaborative research projects with university and community partners to generate research that is both local and global. As public historians, we're committed to doing history for and with the communities of which we are a part. And we do this in three distinct ways. First, we train graduate and undergraduate students in public history methods, values, and ethics, and prepare them for a variety of careers in the public humanities. Second, through public-facing projects like Houston History Magazine, scholars, students, and community members work together to document our rich communities' histories. And third, through public programming under the CPH Lecture Series, we strive to make history matter in Houston by sponsoring lectures, workshops, discussions, and symposia that speak to the value of the humanities in the professions and in the public. 
We are so delighted to mark the publication of the Milestones issue of Houston History Magazine with today's public events honoring the history of African American studies at UH and beyond. Through the magazine, we have the distinct privilege of telling so many interesting stories. But it's especially meaningful when we have the opportunity to work with our friends on campus and to record and promote their rich histories. And so congratulations to uh, Professor Conyers and to African American Studies here at the University of Houston on this, their 50th anniversary. Uh, events like these also help to crystallize the importance of public history and show us how history doesn't just live in our classrooms, it doesn't just live in our textbooks, but it lives in our families, in our homes, and in our communities. Um, a few thank yous are in order, uh, and uh, first of all, I want to thank Dr. Debbie Harwell for everything that she does for Houston History Magazine. She is a force of nature. This magazine would not be what it is without Debbie's dedication and hard work, and so just a quick round of applause for Debbie. She does amazing work uh, training and working with students and mentoring them, and, and we thank you for that. And, and you see the, uh, the fine product that, that they put out every uh, twice a year. Um, also, I want to thank Dr. Harwell and Deidre Fontaine and also Dr. Wesley Jackson, who's our program manager, who worked tirelessly to put this event together. There's so many moving parts that we don't uh, get to see, but um, this would not have happened without them, and so we are deeply grateful to all of you for your, for your help with this. Uh, I want to thank our speakers, Dr. Alexander, Dr. Shabazz, and Dean Fulton for traveling from far and not so far uh, to be with us today to share their experiences and wisdom. And also, I uh, finally want to have a very, very special thanks to Dean Tillis um, and the UH College of Liberal Arts and Social <coughs> Sciences for underwriting today's events. And we are immensely grateful for your support today and for your ongoing support of the magazine, of the center, and our mission to make history matter in Houston. So thank you so much, Dean Tillis. Uh, I would be remiss if I didn't uh, give a plug here uh, that if you want to know more about the Center for Public History, uh, we have copies of our magazine that features our 30th anniversary, which happened a few years ago. Uh, you can also find us online and follow us on Facebook and Twitter at UHCP History. Um, and if you want to know more, uh, we are more than happy to answer those questions uh, about, about CPH and what we do. Um, and with that, I'd like to turn the, the floor over to uh, Debbie Harwell. Thank you. I want to welcome everyone and thank you for being here. We really appreciate it. I want to echo Monica's thanks also to Dean Tillis to Dr. Jackson, to Deidre Fontaine, to all the folks who helped make this possible. I especially want to thank our speakers who are here today. It's been my pleasure as we put this together, getting to know them uh, a bit. And uh, so I've really enjoyed that, and I appreciate every, what everyone has done. We began publishing the Houston History Magazine in 2003. And um, I think I've worked now on 30 issues, if I'm not mistaken, which is sort of mind-boggling uh, to me. Uh, it is published uh, twice a year uh, now in uh, December and in May. And today we, we remain the only in-depth publication that is recording and reporting this type of Houston history, especially the undertold and the untold uh, stories of our region. Our focus is also on training students. So, for example, the magazine that you received a copy of, uh, the vast majority of those articles in there were written by students who either took the Houston history class with me or are interning at the magazine. In fact, we have several of those students who are here today. If you could stand and be recognized, I'd like to give you all a little credit. Um, in fact, uh, Manuel has an article in the Milestones issue, and so does Ruben, who's sitting back there at the welcome table. Um, so we're very, very proud of the work they do. They learn to write, they learn to edit, they conduct oral histories, uh, they learn to make little videos, they proofread. Some of them are far better proofreaders than I am, and so I'm really grateful for them. They also learn to do research. Uh, and I'm, I mean real research, which is also very important. 
Uh, uh, lastly, we also strive to make his history accessible to everyone in the community. And therefore, if you visit our website, HoustonHistoryMagazine.org, you will also find all of our back issues uh, are available there to you anytime to download, to read, to share. Uh, we encourage people in schools um, for presentations, whatever it may be, to look at our work and use it in what they are doing. So we're very happy to be able uh, to offer that to the community. Okay, so I would like to introduce uh, Jim Conyers. He's the director of African American Studies program and the university professor of African American Studies here at U of H. Uh, having guided African American Studies for many, many years, he saw African American Studies reach its goal to become a degree granting institution, which we are particularly <laughs> proud of and which coincided with the 50th anniversary, which is a great way to celebrate That's the milestone. Right. Mm -hmm. However, it's unfortunate it took that long for it to happen, but congratulations Thank on you. that accomplishment. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Uh, I have the pleasure to introduce our panelists and also our moderator. Uh, I have to use these now for reading, so. Work with me for a minute. Our, our first, uh, first panelist is Dr. Leslie Alexander, who's an associate professor of history at the University of Oregon. She received her PhD at Cornell University and taught for 16 years at the Ohio State University before joining the <laughs> faculty at Oregon in 2017. A specialist in early African American and African diaspora history, Dr. Alexander focuses on late 18th century and early 19th century black culture, political consciousness, and resistance movement. A scholar of enslaved and free black communities, her first monograph entitled African or American, Black Identity and Political Activism in New York City, 1784 to 1861, explores black culture, identity, and political activism during the early rat national and antebellum eras. Dr. Alexander's current research project is referred to as the Cradle of Hope, African-American internationalism in the 19th century, and then explores early African-American foreign policy, something that we need to have a conversation about very dearly, foreign policy now. In particular, examines how black activists became involved in international movements for racial and social justice and lobbied the United States government for changes in its policies towards African and African diasporic nations. Using Haiti as an illustrative example of early African-American internationalism, this project charts the changing views black leaders held about Haiti in the 19th century and into the early 20th century. We're looking forward to this work to you know, focus on Haiti again, yes. More specifically, examines how and why Haitian, the Haitian Revolution inspired black activists and why black leaders in the United States fought relentlessly to protect and defend Haitian independence and how they pressured the US government to grant Haiti diplomatic recognition. Dr. Alexander is the immediate past president of the Association for the Study of Worldwide African Diaspora and is an executive council member of the National Council for Black Studies. Dr. Alexander, everyone. Our next panelist is Dr. Amilakar Shabazz, who earned his PhD in history here at the University of Houston by showing his cool <laughs> sweatshirt. All right. He has taught history in Africana studies in the W.B. Du Bois Department of Afro-American Studies at the University of Mass at Hamhurst since 2007. And he served as the department's, department's chair from 07 to 12, and then from 13 to 15, he was a faculty advisor to the Chancellor for Diversity and Excellence. And since 2016, he's acted as the department's interim chair. Uh, it's also important to acknowledge that the department at the University of Mass at Amherst 
uh, offers three degrees in African American studies, a BA, MA, and also a PhD. Second PhD program in the country, right? Yeah. His teaching emphasizes the political economy of social and cultural movements, education and public policy, and additionally his research interests encompass Afro-Americans in the Caribbean, Central and South America, and African-American biography. His numerous publications include the books, Advancing Democracy, African-Americans in the Struggle for Access and Equity in Higher Education in Texas, and the co-edited volume, 40 Acres Documents, which was one of the earliest scholarly works in the modern movement for reparations for enslavement and the racial oppression of people of African descent in North America. A Fulbright Senior Specialist, Shabazz has done work in Brazil, Ghana, Japan, Cuba, and other countries. And presently, he is completing a biography of lawyer, journalist, entrepreneur, Eustonian Carter Wesley. Shabazz uh, was an associate professor of history and director of African American studies at Oklahoma State University. And he was the founding director of its Center for Africana Studies and Development. He served as the first director of the African American Studies Program at the University of Alabama, Tuscaloosa. Is that correct? All right. And in 2014 and 16, Shabazz was elected for a two-year term as the vice president. And now he serves as the Asante Haney. <laughs> He's the president of the National <laughs> Council of Black Studies. Right, I had to slip that. He's the Asante Haney of the National <laughs> Council of Black Studies. I'm very proud. No represent Amen. More hard to say. Yeah, yeah. All right. um, so let's get a hand for Dr. Shabazz, my second panel. I'm trying to stay on this six minute mark that Debbie Hartwell gave me because she will look into your eyes, right? Debbie looks into your eyes and then you just say, yeah. Okay, so, all right. I'm getting close to the six minutes. All right. Um, our, our moderator for this evening is Dr. Joviana Fulton. She earned her doctorate in American Studies with a concentration in African American Literature, Women's Studies, and Oral Discourse Analysis at the University of Minnesota. Since 2012, Dr. Fulton has served as the Dean of the College of Humanities and Social Sciences and Professor in the Department of History, Humanities, and Languages at the University of Houston downtown. Before being appointed at UHD, she was the founding chair of the Department of Gender and Race Studies and Director of Graduate Studies in African American Studies at the University of Alabama, Tuscaloosa? Tuscaloosa. Okay. <laughs> I think y'all make a difference, right? It's not Birmingham. Well, okay. when you say the University of Alabama, <clears throat> yeah. that means yeah. Tuscaloosa. Well, I'm not going to say roll, I'm not gonna say roll <laughs> tide, so you know. I'll just say Tuscaloosa. I'm not going to say roll tide. All right. Uh, committed to academic excellence, diversity, inclusion, and social justice, Dr. Fulton established the Center for Critical Race Studies at UHD interdisciplinary research and academic unit that serves faculty, students, and institutions, and the community through research and teaching by facilitating public discourse and cultivating social justice. Grounded by her experiences uh, at Jima University in Ethiopia, Dr. Fulton is a stalwart proponent of global education in the African diaspora. She established partnerships with universities in Ghana, in France to create opportunities for reciprocal learning and scholarly collaboration for students and faculty. Dr. Fulton's principal research explores African-American women, oral culture, and discursive practices in written and representation in the 19th and early 20th centuries. She is the author of numerous publications and books, including Speaking Power, Black Feminist Orality, and Women's Narratives of Slavery and she is the immediate past president of the Society for the Study of American Women Writers and serves on several boards, including the Council of Colleges of Arts and Sciences, the National Society for the Gifted and Talented, and the Julius C. Hester House in Houston. So again, for our moderator. So we we'll have a great panel this evening. Thank you so much, Dr. Conyers. Um, I want to thank you, first of all, for your leadership of African American studies and um, the opportunities that we at UHD have had to collaborate with you and, and, and your program. Our uh, study abroad to Ghana 
uh, probably wouldn't be in existence in the way that it is uh, had we not had the opportunity to get to know the, the um, facilitators of, of your uh, trip. And we look forward to more collaborations as well. I also want to thank Dr. Harwell for um, reaching out to me and um, in inviting me to participate on this panel. Um, this is really a rare event, right? To have a whole day, because that's it's been my whole day, so a <laughs> uh, whole day um, focused on. African American studies as a discipline, as um, a, um, a movement even, and its relationship to not only the uh, higher education, but also to the communities in which we live and serve. And so I was extremely happy to accept the invitation. However, I would say that I, one, hadn't realized that African American studies had been at UH for 50 years, right? And, and one of the reasons that I was surprised because I also knew that um, the degree in African American studies is what we're coming up on two years now, uh, well, and in process and, you know. Um, and, um, you know, so it, it says something about the struggle, right, of um, the discipline to grow and um, to become an essential part of an institution. So for 48 years, African American studies had a presence here at UH, but um, it's taken this long to get a greater presence. And, um, but that, to me indicates the uh, impact of a dean. A dean who, as an African American studies scholar, and has um, leadership and uh, administrative will, right, to make sure that the discipline in African American studies is viable and um, remains an integral part of the institution. So I want to thank you. Dean Tillis, for your leadership and vision and for your administrative will to make not only this day happen, but to, uh, to demonstrate the importance that African American studies is in the entire pamphlet of degrees here at UH. So thank you, Dean Tillis. <laughs> I uh, also want to thank my colleagues here. So we began a conversation earlier uh, in the day at the Houston Museum of African American Culture. And so we're going to try to keep that conversation going. Um, and we try to approximate a little. We, we had initially envisioned this as a fireside chat, but <laughs> since we don't have a fire. <laughs> uh, 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 but yeah. <laughs> um, but, but as I said, we're going to try to keep this going. Um, so each of us has come to African American studies and black studies from different avenues. Um, it, just like you know, we talked about the um, the struggle to gain degrees. So you know, most scholars in African American studies actually didn't come through an African American studies um, degree program or um, department. But each of us have come in different ways. Um, for me, I was that first generation college student who uh, went to college and for a little while kind of muddled through. Um, I, it was the 80s, sounds like a long time ago, <laughs> right? Uh, and, um, and I was told, oh, you know, get a degree in business, you'll always have a job. And so I majored in business with a concentration in marketing. I worked, uh, I was actually uh, in uh, management at a market research firm, but I realized that I, um, didn't really have any passion for it. Mm -hmm. I didn't have a vision for myself of what I would be doing in 10, 20 years, or, you know, the like. 
Uh, and I decided that I needed to do something that I loved, yeah. and I needed to do something that was going to make a difference. So I thought really deeply about, well, what is that? And um, the only thing that I could come up with, and at the time I thought, like, well, you know, it's not really much, but I love to read. So I figured <clears throat> I'd become a high school English teacher because I knew high school English teachers and I knew how to make that happen. Mm. Um, so transferred, changed my major. Um, in my second term, took an African American literature course and in walked a black woman professor who looked like me. Changed my life, really. Uh, because, and I tell Gabrielle Foreman this all the time, and she's like, oh, no, I'm like, yes, you changed my life. Because one, I could envision myself in that role, um, but also the breadth of knowledge and um, her being you know, a model, right, to say this is what you can be, and having the heart for mentorship to say, you know, if you are interested, she said to me, you know, I think you have the potential to get a PhD, and if you're willing to work hard, I'm willing to help you, mm -hmm. all right? And uh, so that kind of got me on the road to uh, studying African American literature uh, because, one, I began to see that the culture in my community was a valid uh, subject for mm -hmm. scholarly mm -hmm. study, all right? Um, and, and so I uh, completed my doctorate in American Studies at the University of Minnesota, um, which there I, at Minnesota and Michigan, worked with a whole host of scholars, right? Earl Lewis at Michigan, mm -hmm. uh, Bob Chrisman, Rose Brewer, John Wright, all of these wow. scholars, right, who were uh, very formative, <clears throat> um, and got introduced to black feminism. And didn't, you know, when you, when you start graduate school and they say, okay, well, you know, you need a theory, right, <laughs> for all of your work. And, you know, at, again, going back, this is like, you know, the um, early 90s, late 80s, early 90s, and it was, everyone was all into deconstruction and Michelle Foucault, <laughs> and, you know, and, and I was like, well, yeah, I guess I could get with that. Um, but then was introduced to Patricia Hill Collins the Kambahi River Collective, um, I, I knew Audre Lorde and Bell Hooks, but beginning to see how the work, this work could provide an epistemological fr framework for um, my work, for the lives of the women who I knew, and, and for my community. And, and so that is the, the um, foundation, I think, for not just my work, but then it becomes a foundation for your life, right? Mm -hmm. uh, how you um, be, develop a philosophy for mm -hmm. your life. Um, but when I finished my doctorate, you know, I knew that I had to articulate for myself and for my community, uh, my people, who, if they ask why reading and writing books was important. <laughs> Um, because as proud of me as they were, I really felt like I needed to be able to articulate um, what impact on the community, um, how what I did would make a difference. And so um, I really had to go back to my core principles of believing in human equality and social justice. Mm -hmm. and, and, and as probably I'm sure you know, and those of us who've taught African American studies have had experiences where you have a lot of resistance sometime mm -hmm. in the classroom, yeah. right? And, and coming to the realization that not everyone is going to want to hear what you have to say. Mm -hmm. uh, but knowing that, again, going back to that passion and knowing that you know you're doing the, the work that you were meant to do that's going to make a difference to um, students as well as to our community and our um, greater communities. Um, so I pursued my career in African American studies with this kind of foundation, yeah. right, and then moved into administration because I realized that if you're going to make a greater impact on the institution, you have to have a seat at the table. Mm -hmm. Right, and um, that has been um, very rewarding for me personally, but also being able to see 
um, have the opportunity to uh, help establish the Center for Crit uh, Critical Race Studies mm -hmm. at UHD, um, hiring faculty, supporting students, creating programs, all of uh, those kinds of opportunities. But when I thought about, you know, I think back to, you know, thinking about, wow, you know, I need to have a passion and do something I love. I didn't, that wasn't, you know, in the vision because I could never have envisioned that. Hmm. But I, um, having along the way models of, of scholarly models, mm -hmm. right, and opportunities hmm. uh, has, has uh, helped to uh, facilitate and bring that vision uh, into reality, mm -hmm. right? Um, so that's how I come. Mm -hmm. to African American studies. Mm -hmm. I'd like to hear from you to find out how have you come to the discipline? It's actually interesting. It's, uh, this is actually one of my favorite questions when we're on panels like this because it, it really does sort of cause you to take a moment and sort of reflect on your own journey. And I actually feel like it helps me be a better professor mm -hmm. because I remember what made a difference to me as a student, and it reminds me of what I feel like I want to be doing um, in my classrooms and in my interactions with students. But it, it was really interesting and, you know, sort of touching for me to hear you talk about your story because it reminded me so much of my own. Um, I also started, I, I came to African American Studies through college. Um, as an undergraduate student, I had really not been introduced to it prior to that. Um, and had a very similar experience to yours where I didn't have a whole lot of role models and guidance about what college should look like and what, you know how to navigate um, the college experience. And so I started as an undergraduate without truly a clear sense of what I wanted to do. Mm -hmm. um, the one thing that I did have and still have um, <laughs> is um, a sister who's three years older than me. So she was a senior in college at the time that I was a freshman. So I had been able to sort of glean a little bit, <laughs> right, from um, observing her from afar. And she was a political science major. Mm -hmm. So I was like, that sounds good. Like, I don't, <laughs> <laughs> I know it has something to do with politics and I'm interested in stuff like that. And, um, you know, I, it, it just sounded good. Political science, it sounded like it, you know, had something to it and something about it. So I entered into college saying, I'm a political science major, not really knowing, you know, and she was planning to go to law school. So I thought, okay, that sounds good too. So mm -hmm. I'm a political science major and I'm gonna to go to law school too um, and then in my sophomore year you know it's funny because there's that expression that for some reason kind of irks me but that's true where people say you remember moments you know not days mm -hmm. and I actually to this day <laughs> remember a particular moment where like the black studies light switch went on for me mm -hmm. Um, it was in my second year, it was a sophomore, and it's like really crazy because I literally can picture the room that I was sitting in, I remember where the, my desk was oriented, I remember how the light looked coming through the window, I mean every detail um, of sitting in that classroom and sort of having that, that light switch moment. Um, but for me, it was actually interesting, again, because it was a, a black female professor. Mm -hmm. Some of you may remember Sylvia Winter, mm -hmm. who was kind of one of the, one of the many founding queens of, of black studies. I, of course, as a 19-year-old sophomore, had no idea <laughs> right, who she was or whose presence mm -hmm. I was in. Um, but she began to lecture about the Middle Passage of the transatlantic trade in humans. I was in a um, introduction to African American studies class, which I'll be honest, I had just taken as an elective. Like, okay, I need to fill that and okay, let's try that out. Mm -hmm. um, but she began to lecture on this topic and I'll just, I'm just gonna keep it real with y'all. <laughs> like, I became filled with rage mm -hmm. and my rage, interestingly enough, was actually not so much about the story that she was telling, although that was something to feel angry about. My rage was actually about, I cannot believe no one has ever told me this before. 
Like, I felt like, how did I get to be 19 years old? And I have been in school my whole life, and no one has ever told me about this before. And at that time, I still didn't know how people became professors. <laughs> I didn't know that like getting a PhD was a thing. You know, I, I, I still didn't know any of that. But I remember thinking, I want to be a person who is part of making sure that this never happens to someone again. <laughs> you know, that we, none of us should ever be in a situation where we get to be this age, you know, or this position in life, and we have never heard of this before. And I just felt like, I, I don't know what that looks like, I don't know how to do that, <laughs> um, but I, I want to be part of that. And um, so that was a real turning point for me. Obviously, political science as a major went out the window, as did law school. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> but. It really opened up a whole new a whole new sort of world for me. And I think really the thing that I was the most fortunate, and again, it resonates a lot with your story, I think one of the things I was really fortunate to have is a series of people along the way who, as I always say now, saw something in me that I did not see in myself. <laughs> and that was that there were key, um, sometimes they were staff people at the university. Sometimes they were faculty members who kind of said, why don't you try this? Why don't you try that? You know, why don't you try research? Why, hey, there's a thing called a PhD and that's a thing you could do, right? Um, so sort of introduced me to um, these opportunities and these possibilities uh, along the way. Claiborne Carson, who was the director of the um, Martin Luther King Papers Project, gave me my first opportunity to actually do research. Um, he actually used the King Papers Project as an opportunity to conduct research on Malcolm X. <laughs> um, and so that was kind of my first, we worked with him on Malcolm X's FBI file, and that was my first um, sort of research-related opportunity. Um, from there, I did like a research, a summer research um, exchange program, mm -hmm. um, and it was actually through that that I met my dissertation advisor, who, like you said, was a black woman who, after I finished the program, sent me a note and said, if you ever want to get a PhD, that is something you can do, <laughs> um, and you can come and work with me. Um, and so that's how I found myself at Cornell in a PhD program. Um, so it's, it's, it's really, it's resonating with me, <laughs> right? The ways in which certain people come into your life at certain moments and sort of see something that you don't see in yourself. But I think for me, my personal connection to African American studies, to black studies, African diaspora studies, began and continues to be about that feeling of these stories have to be told. Like, right. you know, the, the, this, these histories, these cultures, these experiences, we cannot continue to be a society, right, in which, um, in which all of this is silenced. And so that is really what I think drew me into it. Yeah, and that, that's what keeps me in the game. <laughs> wow, this is a good question, and I think uh, what I've heard, and I thank you all for the opportunity to share. Um, I'd like to just give a little passage from Toni Morrison to set the stage for my story. Some things go, pass on. Some things just stay. I used to think it was my rememory. You know, some things you forget, other things you never do. But it's not places. Places are still there. If a house burns down, it's gone, but the place, the picture of it, stays, and not just in my memory, but out there in the world. What I remember is a picture floating around out there, outside my head. I mean, even if I don't think it, even if I die, the picture of what I did, or knew, or saw, is still out there. Said it to Denver and Toni Morrison's beloved. Sankofa, return and go and fetch it. It is the Akan proverb, it is not taboo to fetch what is at risk of being left behind. I'd have to say my journey in African-American studies, long before going to the college campus, 
was really the foundation for it was being raised and, and experiencing a community of storytellers. My grandmother, number one, but then her sisters, uh, when they'd come to the house, uh, all of these remarkable women, and when they tell their stories, I would just sit and listen, and I would learn how to be a good listener, and I would, and they filled, they filled me up with so many questions. My, uh, my play aunt, Yvonne Robinson Jackson, um, she gave me a book when I was a little kid called Tell Me Why, because I was always asking other questions. I hear things, and I ask questions, and I ask questions. My mother was a school teacher, so I got, I was raised in, with that academic mindset, you know, correcting your grammar and correcting this and that, but, but I loved the code switching. I loved the, what I would hear, because I lived right across the street from a, from, a, from a housing project, Lincoln Terrace in Beaumont, Texas, and, uh, and all around me, they're African-American English speakers. That was just the language I would hear. And then from my grandmother and my own family, I would hear Louisiana Creole, Afro-Creole, so I'm hearing that, I'm hearing African-American English, and then my mother is beating in me standard, you know, money English, American <laughs> English, because she wanted me to get through school. She, the last thing she wanted me to be was a teacher. Oh no, not enough respect, <laughs> not enough money, baby, go get, go, you know, business, law, something, make some money, Jack, and, Jack, and, and change the world that way. But, um, so I guess I could be like, be a Bloomberg today, uh, <laughs> or Trump. But, uh, but, you know, but again, I, so I love the, the, uh, the academics, I love the intellectual journey, I love the culture uh, and the stories I was surrounded by. My grandmother, um, in the 70s, and you know, I wanted to wear an afro, but uh, my hair is really, really nappy. I was the nappiest and the darkest thing in my family. Everybody else was lighter than me, everybody else had straight hair. But um, for me to have an afro, my grandmother, would plait my hair every night. So I'd wash my hair, I'd comb it out real good, and then she would plait it, kind of less than cornrows, just really easy. And, and then in the morning, I would take the plaits out and I could comb it out with my rake, and I wouldn't have a jacked up looking afro. I would have a nice, round, you know, cool <laughs> afro. But, uh, but those nights, after she'd worked all day, after she did things all day, she would just sit there and plait my hair, and I could get stories from her the 1943 Beaumont race riot. She was in it. My grandfather was part of those people in the community that was protecting their homes and the black community from the white mobs that went through Beaumont rampaging, wanted to try to do one of these situations where they would, they would try to get all the blacks to leave Beaumont. Didn't work. They defended their homes. They, did, they stayed in place. They didn't get burned out and run off. They did burn out the business district downtown in Irving, Street and Forsyth Street, and I had relatives who lost their businesses, but, uh, but we didn't get burned out, all the total communities, and we stayed. So I would hear these stories, how they defended the community, stories of lynching, story. So my curiosity was wedded there. Then in school itself, and I was all black school elementary at West Oakland Elementary, all black junior high school, John P. Odom, middle uh, junior high school, but then they changed, they flipped the script, and they sent me to uh, all white, majority white uh, high school, Monsignor Kelly High School, Catholic high school for, my, for those four years. And that's where I first interact, started interacting with white people, okay? Because uh, I didn't see the white priest in my parish as a, as a, as a white person. They were in a, a representative of God. So I didn't even see, we didn't even count race for them, except sometime when they'd act, act out. But, uh, but they, 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 you know, but at the, with the white kids, that's where I started seeing it's okay. I, it's really a different world here. And um, I went on to University of Texas at Austin and I, uh, my white roommate, my from, from friend of mine from high school, he heard me one day talking to a friend of mine from back home, from Beaumont. And I was just going, oh, we're really girl, show enough, what's going on? As soon as I got off the phone, show up. What do you say, Shabbat, my, my given name, my birth name? You don't talk like that. What's wrong with you? That's not how you talk. I'm like, just never heard how I talk, Joe. I talk a lot of, <laughs> I talk a lot of ways. I'm talking to a homegirl back home. That's how we talk. Show up, girl, what's going on? You know, but that's not you. You're changing. I said, no, you, you just see a different side of me, Joe. Um, so the, you know, and then I'd leave we, at UT the one time for any kind of black activities was Soul Night. 
uh, in the student union. So he'd see me going to Seoul. Now, you don't like that kind of music. You listen to Wagner. You listen to, you know, all this uh, Beethoven. And so I say, yes, I do. But I also enjoy going in here in my confunction and my, uh, you know, my earth, wind, and fire. And my, uh, you know, I, I love that stuff too. So, you know, living that, but then African American studies at UT, as I encountered it, gave you a much more intellectual context and, and, and architecture for really understanding these, these diverse experiences and the hierarchies and all the different things you're, you know, I, I, was, I had encountered already. It gave me an intellectual framework for beginning to understand. And I, was, and I had a rich experience at UT Austin. John Warfield took two classes with him. He was struggling to make a real goal of black studies at UT. Uh, he was very community engaged, so I saw that aspect of him. We found, he founded a community listener supported radio station in Austin that still exists, um, um, K-A-Z-I, West, uh, Kiswahili word meaning work, Kazi meaning work. And I'm in his room, in his uh, living room, in his house, as we're mapping out, you know, the, the launching of that radio station. I was one of, the, one of the first program hosts. My show was called It's a New African Day. It was like a two, three hour long talk uh, music show, played a lot of reggae, because that was what I was into, and uh, had interviews, Harriet Mullen. I had Harriet mm -hmm. Mullen come on and read poetry and, and other people. Um, but. Um, but professor-wise, John Warfield, um, William Darity Jr., Sandy Darity, uh, Sam Myers, Rose Brewer, uh, these are just some of the African Americans. I also had people like Doug Kellner and, and um, uh, Harry Cleaver uh, and um, uh, Carl Galinsky, because my foreign language was Latin. I took a lot of Latin and classics um, uh, courses. So, you know, a, a really rich experience and uh, he and John Warfield, I would really say, gave me the example of the Africana Studies scholar that, that as our motto in National Council for Black Studies, academic excellence, social responsibility, and cultural grounding. John lived that. He brought that. Um, and I could talk a lot about John, but, uh, but all of them were, made great impressions on me. William, Darity, Sandy Darity really adopted me. I was the only African-American major in economics. Uh, we didn't have a major in African-American African studies, so my major was economics, and he just poured a lot of attention on me and really wanted me to go to grad school in um, uh, economics. Um, but he finally forgave me that I came here to U, U, U of H and majored in history instead. <laughs> so African American studies, obviously, as a discipline, has uh, impacted us a lot personally. Yes. Um, but how would you say the discipline and scholarship has changed public discourse um, on race and on about or by black people? Well, first it started it. And it started it with our uh, kind of paradigmatic leader, uh, W.E.B. Du Bois. Um, he opens the discourse uh, in many ways on, on race in, in, as, a, as an academic, as an intellectual kind of uh, 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 concern. And, uh, and so we, we stand on his shoulders and continue to build from there. But I've seen many uh, developments uh, within African American studies, Africana studies, and, and its impact right here in, in Houston. So when I came in, Jean Ladding Cantambu was uh, the director of our program here. She turned the gavel over to Linda Reed. You had an eight year long run? Was it eight or nine? 10 year long <laughs> run. Wow. So, and Linda did so, so much. Um, you know, we, we had two kind of intellectual uh, uh, projects, one in, on culture and the other on uh, policy matters that, uh, um, uh, was really pushing, trying to push out into the community that public facing work that mm -hmm. we talk about. Um, we, it, it, it was a glue for a lot of the, the uh, cohort of scholars here with interest in African American studies from the law school like Elwin Lee to Lawrence Hogue in the English department to just a, an array of scholars, white, and white, black, otherwise um, Janice Hutchinson uh, uh, did a little tour duty in there at one point. Uh, they bring, brought in all kind of great visiting scholars. So it was a, it was a glue and it, its impact really grew. I think if I recall, the line item uh, for the budget 
used to be a special, separate kind of thing for Mexican American studies and African American studies in the budget with the state legislature. And y'all set it up nicely that way to make sure that it, so it wasn't an argument about our funding from year to year. We, it was clear cut and those legislators, you know, would look out for that every year in the budget. Um, so we, we were able to build, we've, we've been able to make an impact. I recall when I was here writing that I wanted um, uh, U of H African Americans, I felt it had the capacity to be the temple of the South. Because uh, even by the 90s, there were very many strong African American studies programs or departments in the South, from Texas all the way to Virginia. There just weren't very many very strong uh, uh, programs. And so I wanted to see U of H, I felt in one of the largest cities in America, third, fourth largest city, it could really lead out and be that. Uh, and really develop that, that kind of uh, uh, power and capacity in public policy and cultural studies areas and, uh, and in developing the, the, uh, the intellectual, the connections among scholars. And I'm pleased to say it's, it's continued to move along in that regard. Yeah, I mean, I think that, again, we're now 50 years in mm -hmm. to the discipline. Um, and I think because of that, we have a tendency to forget that the entire face mm -hmm. of American universities has, was transformed by the introduction of black studies. <laughs> you know, in this day and age, undergraduate, even graduate students sort of take for granted, right, that we have women, gender, and sexuality studies, um, that queer studies is, is an academic discipline, that, um, you know, all of the other area and ethnic studies <laughs> programs and departments exist. Um, and it's, we're fortunate, right? But it's very easy to sort of take that for granted and to forget that if it was not for um, the bold and brave and courageous and radical action of predominantly black students on campuses all across the country insisting upon the formation and establishment of black studies, none of that would have come into being um, in the way that it did and at the time that it did. And it's interesting, and I think we'll probably get to this a little bit later, but it is interesting to be in a political moment, <laughs> right, where black studies in a lot of circles has fallen out of fashion, right? Um, and yet, I, you know, we continue to sort of neglect and forget the very powerful reality that American universities would look nothing like what they look like um, if it were not for the establishment of black studies. And I guess sort of just quickly in connection with that, I do want to underscore the fact that it wasn't just students who participated in the establishment of these black studies programs. As I was saying a little bit earlier today, black studies is a discipline that came into being as the result of being the intellectual wing of a movement that involved community people. So if it wasn't for the commitment and the activism of folks who likely never had the opportunity to even set foot on a college campus, if it wasn't for the commitment and vision of those folks, black studies never would have come into being, and American universities would look very different um, today than, than how they look. Yeah. But it's not just American universities. Right, right? that's right. Our whole, all the representation that we see in whether it's film or television, yes. and, and so many ways, really owes uh, in part to black studies. Yes. Right. Yeah. Because if you don't have the scholarship, I mean, think about all of the works out there, right? That uh, right. that we have um, take that we uh, not only enjoy, but. And over and over again, now we're starting to see, kind of feel like, well, yeah, you know, it's another black TV show, right? <laughs> uh, uh, I'm a blackish fan, right? Uh, but, you know, and it is so connected to black studies. Right? Yes. That is the little vignettes and middle mm -hmm. and, you know, all of that knowledge comes out of black studies. Yes. Right? Yes. Um, but that does get to the point. That is that here we are 50 years on um, and the discipline is still struggling, mm -hmm. right? Um, many programs across the country are either underfunded or threatened with elimination. Um, 
and there are many fewer departments than they are, are programs, right? It's actually sometimes a surprise. They're like, oh, that's a department, yeah. you know, rather than just a program. So how do we secure the discipline in colleges and universities so not only do they survive, but they actually thrive? especially if you're in a situation where you don't have a line item in the budget, right? Yeah. I mean, I think, I will say for me, I think there's a, a few different things. I think one is that, and again, this is sort of a continuation of a, of a conversation from earlier today, but I think that as Black Studies faculty, we have a lot more work to do <laughs> than we were perhaps expecting to do when we came into the discipline. Um, I, we, you know, most of us came into the discipline at a time when the existence of black studies was under siege, but understood that it was going to exist. Um, and students were engaged in the discipline in, um, in a particular kind of way. And so many of us as faculty members didn't enter into the discipline with an understanding or an expectation that we were gonna have to be recruiters and advocates and <laughs> you know interface with donors and all those kinds of things. But I think that faculty increasingly are gonna have to reimagine um, what their role relative to the discipline might actually look like and mm -hmm. um, the contributions that we need to make and um, what we might be called upon to do. And so in my mind, um, that is in part about doing a different type of outreach and advocacy mm -hmm. among students. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things that I talked a little bit about earlier today is the importance of um, sort of meeting today's generation of students where they are <laughs> um, and helping them to effectively see the connections between black studies as a discipline and their lived experience um, in society today. So I think that faculty have to start doing more in that regard. I think we also have to, and the truth is, is that I imagine that many of you who are just sort of in the humanities more generally, um, I think this is something that all of us in the humanities have to do, is that um, we have to do more work mm -hmm. to help explain to administrators the importance and the legitimacy of what it is um, that we do. Um, and so we actually have to start being advocates for ourselves um, among administrators and really showing the value of um, what a black studies degree and sort of what the humanities in general um, has to contribute. Um, and I also think that we have to start putting ourselves in the position of having conversations and reaching out to donors. That is something <laughs> faculty are typically not used to or comfortable or even desirous um, of, of doing. And yet in this day and age when the political climate is not necessarily in the favor of, um, of higher education, we actually, you know, if you're talking about thriving mm -hmm. as opposed to surviving, <laughs> then that means that we have to think about our financial survival. And so part of that is about being willing, right, to put ourselves um, in front of donors and speaking about um, the importance of what we do. And I guess the last thing that I would say, and I think you and Antonio are amazing and beautiful examples of this, is that more of us have to be willing to step into roles that we might not necessarily have imagined um, for ourselves, or again, even necessarily been desirous um, of, of stepping into. But I mean, the two of you are beautiful examples, right, of um, the ways in which we can advance the discipline when we're in positions, right, that have the authority and the ability um, to do it. You all are very fortunate um, at the UH to have um, the two of you here. Let me just tell you, for those of you who are not at other universities, <laughs> not everyone has this. <laughs> um, but yeah, so I mean, I think we also have to be willing to put ourselves in positions and take on particular kind of roles that make it possible for us to really make meaningful decisions that can allow for the discipline to thrive. I'd like to pick up on some of that to say, um, you know, it's kind of different. We've, African American studies have weathered a lot of attacks. I remember back, um, back in the 80s, the 90s, one of the things uh, we were attacked was that the very thing you're talking about, how we opened the door to women's studies, gender studies, all these other things coming. There was, the, we were criticized for that. 
Um, if you remember, Arthur Schlesinger wrote this book, The Disuniting of America. Mm. African American studies was tearing us apart. He's, you know, <laughs> keeping us from finding the common ground we should have as Americans and disuniting us. Um, Dinesh Sousa said we were the most illiberal, mm. you know, <laughs> aspect of the liberal arts university because we were trying to make Nazis out of everybody. Um, lo and behold, there were some other folks trying to make Nazis <laughs> out, of, out of folks. But, but that's, we weathered those storms. We made it through that. We beat that kind of nonsense back. I think a lot of the threats today comes from a phenomenon called neoliberalism and this idea that, you know, everything that, that the market forces are should be the real arbiters of value and, mm -hmm. and uh, let's privatize the hell out of everything. And so from a center for public history standpoint, it ought to be very important because what it raises the question, what is the public anymore? Is there a public that we care about? Do we care about the pu a public university, mm -hmm. you know, or you know, does it have to again respond to those market forces and figure out how to how to be you know how to make money and, and build you know capital? So the, that that's a lot of the real threat. And so for us, I think it is a broader the whole humanities needs to be worried right now, not just African American studies, because. There was, the person who kind of pointed to this problem back in 1966 was a couple of economists, um, William Bomo and William Bowen. They had a piece they published called Performing Arts, the Economic Dilemma, a study of problems common to theater, opera, music, and dance. And Bomo was, is famous in economics research for the problem of optimization and, and a whole lot of interesting stuff to it. But, but what it, they really pointed out, theater, opera, music, dance is never going to be cost effective. If you analyze it from a pure market standpoint and what value does it bring and how much it costs to bring that value, it never makes sense. It will never make sense, okay? From a supply, again, if you apply forces of supply and demand, to it would never make sense. The, all the labor and the cost to train an oboe player or a trumpet player or whatever it is who can then be at that level of excellence and can then perform and, and, and make everybody happy. It's too expensive, folks. It just doesn't make sense. And yet, we, isn't that great? Don't we want another Miles Davis to come up, another Billie Holiday, right? Isn't, wouldn't that be nice to have those kinds of incredible musical artists, performers, people on the stage who really take us to another level in their performance? But again, there's an economic dilemma to it. It never will make sense. So we've got to question our values. What really matters? What do we value? as a public, as a people? And then are we willing to fight for those values against folks who want to make everything be, arbit you know, the, the arbiter of values to simply be what's selling? What can sell, right? Or then the few things that they do keep around, it's gonna be up to the super rich, that 1% who will care enough to say, oh, okay, I'll give a few million over here to keep, the, to keep the, uh, the Houston Opera going or to keep the symphony going or to keep this going. And then like you say, we gotta go have those meetings with donors to say, hey, why don't you keep African American studies going too? No, folks, it ought to be all the public, the, the 100%. That, can, that argues and, and discusses those values and what we contribute and say, hey, 100%, we, we want to keep this going. This is important. The stories it's telling, the rememory it brings for us. When I was at, uh, um, and Linda didn't want me to take that full-time job, but I took a full-time job at Prairie View as I had a little, uh, I, I had, <clears throat> needed a little more money than just that thousand a month stipend, which I was blessed to receive. But when I took that out at Prairie View, I worked with a wonderful woman named Jewel Prestige and, uh, and Mac Jones and other folks there. And one of the things we worked on was a humanities grant to bring the next year uh, John Hope Franklin to speak on the campus. And, um, and so even though I had left by that point and I was at U of H downtown, uh, I still went back for the talk that, uh, with, that Professor Franklin brought uh, to the campus. And, uh, and he was brilliant. He's, you know, 
one of our great treasures and, and dean of African American historians and all of that. But in the audience, in Q&A, this is 1993, four or something, the students had been turned on to this whole idea of reparations by myself and Imari Obadelli. Imari Obadelli was a political scientist. He was teaching there. And myself, learning a lot from Imari, we had been working on trying this idea of reparations for slavery and, and racial oppression and been telling the students about it and got them fired. So during Q&A, they asked, Professor Franklin, what do you think about reparations for African Americans and would you speak to us on it? How dare you ask such a, uh, such a question? Don't you understand? White people are not interested in that conversation at all and so we must be realistic and just not talk foolishness. I must say though, before he passed away, he'd come around a lot. Um, scholars like uh, the great law professor Charles Ogletree from Harvard and Al Brophy and others had begun looking particularly at the Tulsa racial massacre of 1921 of which his father had been a victim. He wasn't in, John Hope wasn't in Tulsa because they lived in an all black community in Tulsa. There were black towns in Tulsa, in, in, in Oklahoma. And so it was right outside of Tulsa, but it was this all black community. The biggest division there wasn't white versus black. It was Methodist versus Baptist. If you read his book, Mirror on America, he tells you all of this. The Baptists hated, black Baptists hated the black Methodists, and that was their biggest division. But when you got to Tulsa, then you had to deal with the white problem, and his father's law firm got burnt out, all the black business district and Wall Street. And he had just kind of blocked it from his mind. But before he passed, he was very much interested, because they were still living survivors, too. He, wanted, he felt Tulsa ought to have some form of reparations, and the state of Oklahoma ought to pay some form of reparations for, to the victims and, to, and, and, and for that. So he came around quite a bit on, the, on that subject. And the country has come around. You know, sitting through the Democratic primaries and having Marion, uh, uh, the candidate Williamson, and then Cory Booker, who's a, who's a signature of the bill that's right now in the Senate, Senate Bill 1083, and that Sheila Jackson Lee introduced uh, the new version of the House bill, House Bill 40, H.R. 40. Love Sheila Jackson Lee for that. Um, that bill now picking, has picked up so many more endorsers much more bipartisan than when John Conyers first introduced it many years ago, working with Mario Bedelli and many of us in Encobra. So things change, things are moving, the discourse is, evolves, and African American studies and people in, in, the, in the discipline have played a big part in that because we have raised inconvenient truths and have raised some difficult questions in our scholarship and in our public-facing work that stands on the shoulders of the Fannie Lou Hamer, stands on the shoulders of the Deloitte Parker, stands on the shoulders of all of the folks, the Gene Locks and many others that pushed from the 60s, and we must continue to do it as we go forward. Well, and thank you. I, I, one of the things that I think of as a dean of a college of humanities and social sciences where we're always in a position where we're arguing for the relevance of mm -hmm. our college, um, particularly humanities, and I always think that it's not coincidental that uh, African American studies and um, other cultural studies programs, like as they grow and become stronger, then you actually have to fight for liberal mm -hmm. arts mm -hmm. and, and why it's important. Yes. Um, so um, so I, I really thank you for that connection. Um, but I want to go back to uh, the point that you made about the discipline evolving. Mm -hmm. So um, how would you say that the discipline, and particularly the um, curriculum, uh, has changed, uh, or would you say it has changed, and then where do you think it may go in the future? Um, I think we are, and we need to return and to really revisit um, what are some of the, if we take some of our, our, our lessons to the international level. Um, we've been training in the Du Bois department, like you say, we have three degrees at every level, and um, we started admitting some scholars 
for our doctoral program and, and, and in other parts of the campus too, in sociology and some other areas, from Columbia. Columbia, since the 1990s in a new constitution, they have just, um, they sort of had some formal recognition at the societal level that, of, of, that there are Afro-Columbians. Mm -hmm. Before then in countries like Columbia, Professor Till, you, you know how some of this phenomena is emerging. In this kind of consciousness that, that is emerging in places like Columbia now, has really begun to, to bring in a lot of the questions we ushered in in the 60s are being ushered in now. Where is our black studies in the Colombian universities? Where are we learning about and teaching to the larger society about the African experience in Colombia? Mm -hmm. So I see an internationalization mm -hmm. of Africana studies as part of uh, the future direction. Uh, I didn't know until I got to the University of Alabama and I had a student um, there from Japan informed me that there was something called the Japan Black Studies Association. Oh, yeah. mm -hmm. And JBSA is older than NCBS. Yes. NCBS goes back to 1975, Japan Black Studies Association goes back to 1954. Yes. And the foundation of their even starting was basically largely on the translation of different works, particularly Du Bois. But then over the years, they've gotten very involved in, in, black, in, in just wanting black writers. They see that, that different kind of language in, 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 the, in, in the writers like Toni Morrison and writers like Alice Walker and, uh, and, and more contemporary writers of today, Colson Whitehead and others, that they love it and they eat it up and, and they just, and they meet annually. They have serious and they, uh, uh, discussions. They have a growing network, and they're even moving now to find ways to kind of bring these this, these discussions, bring Africana studies into the curricula of the higher ed of the academy in Japan to be more more pervasive, more uh, um, as part of foreign studies or whatever international studies. There, uh, Europe has formations, the uh, Collegium for African American Research. Uh, they've started black studies in Germany in one of the universities in Bremen. Uh, in, in the UK, they're developing a lot. They just recruited Tommy Curry over there to, uh, to, to yeah. Edinburgh. Yeah. Uh, and, um, you know, and so he's bringing a lot of Africana studies over there, uh, along with other people from there that, that have been doing this for a while. So I see one thing I would put in the conversation is sort of the internationalization of Africana mm -hmm. studies. It's, it's immense. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I, I completely agree. And I, in, a, in an interesting way, I feel like um, black and Africana studies is actually now starting to circle back around to its founding principles. Mm -hmm. um, if, if you look at, yeah, so if you look at the, at the founding documents of most of the sort of the, what I think of as the first wave um, of the establishment of, of black studies programs, they had kind of, in my mind, they had sort of three things in common. One being a, an emphasis on diaspora um, and internationalism, um, which you were talking about. The second was about a commitment um, to community, um, and and the third was really about um, sort of the ways in which we can understand. Um, I guess really in a way it is back to this sort of concept of, of internationalism. You were kind of talking about it in terms of Pan-Africanism. Um, but I think it was also about wanting to be interdisciplinary and thinking not just about the humanities, although obviously I'm a historian, so you know, <laughs> that's where my heart is. But thinking broadly in terms of how um, black studies could be um, relevant to other types of um, areas of study. And I think sort of somewhere along the, the way, <laughs> um, we've gone a little bit off the rails, you know, in the process, I think, of becoming sort of institutionalized. And as I was saying a little bit earlier today, you know, sort of the publisher parish and, you know, getting sort of caught up in what it means to sort of exist within the academy. 
Black Studies, I think, has done really well in terms of championing certain aspects of its original purpose. Mm -hmm. um, but I think some of these areas, particularly around the, the sort of focus on um, community and also really thinking deeply and meaningfully in interdisciplinary ways, we sort of went a little bit off the rails. <laughs> and it's interesting to me that I think um, I actually have started working with a, a group of people um, wanting to convene a series of national conversations about like, okay, we're 50 years into the discipline, where do we want to go over the next um, 50 years? And it's interesting to me that these founding ideas are coming back around again. Um, obviously, as, as Shabazz was talking about, diaspora and internationalism, but I think people are really wanting to have deep and meaningful conversation about how do we bring black studies back to the community, right? And how do we make sure that black studies continues to service and be engaged in the communities um, in which we exist. But I think people are also trying to sort of break down some of these disciplinary silos mm -hmm. and have a conversation about what is the relationship between black studies and public health? Mm -hmm. You know, Absolutely. what is the relationship between black studies and economics and business? You know, what is the relationship between um, black studies and, you know, the law, well, black <laughs> right? Black studies and data science. Exactly, black studies and data science, black studies and technology, right? Um, black studies, and I, I just read recently about a group of people who are looking at the relationship between black studies and artificial intelligence, mm -hmm. you know? Exactly. So I think that, um, fortunately, I think we are kind of now starting to circle back around to um, some of our founding principles and really wanting to think about how do we make black studies relevant um, and how do we bring black studies as a discipline, you know, to these other um, areas of, of intellectual um, inquiry. And again, how do we sort of make it meaningful in, in the communities in which we, we, we exist? Um, I will say, and this is sort of my, my, my one other little plug um, for black studies, is that I think one of the ways in which we really have improved and grown over the years is that um, I see our organizations and I see our scholarship becoming so much more inclusive um, and thoughtful about issues of gender and sexuality. Um, I, and I actually feel like black studies for a, a long time sort of got a bad rap in that regard. I'm not sure that's ever something we've done totally badly. Um, but we certainly have improved. Um, dramatically and I think the ways in which the discipline has moved forward in terms of incorporating different forms of feminism and womanism and thinking more broadly about relationships between black studies and sexuality studies I think has really been um, the, the one thing that maybe was not as clearly articulated in the founding <laughs> documents, um, but that has actually, I think, become a really important manifestation. I, I agree. I, I remember when we first established the Department of Gender and Race Studies at the University of Alabama, yeah. and I was warned by uh, several people, some uh, bigger names in African American <laughs> studies, who said, you know, you really got to be careful <laughs> yeah. because these have two disciplinary genealogies that are very different, and you want to make sure that um, you are not letting, you know, the one, the women's studies in particular, that was the, uh, would uh, subsume mm -hmm. black studies, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. um, and, and so I took that to heart, right? But we also decided to make sure that we created a department where there was equal enfranchisement. Yeah. Um, it, it wasn't hard in that department, given that um, the majority of faculty in the department did work on Africana women. Yes. Um, but uh, it, 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 the thing that was surprising was this warning, right? Um, but we were really, um, really, I think, happy to be able to bring in new graduate students who were doing, who, who are taking courses in black feminism and taking, teaching intro to women's studies. Yes. Or something like that, yeah, right? right? So yeah. I think um, that has made a difference. Yeah. And I think you said it's really been an evolution in the discipline. Um, but, you know, so one of the things that we do 
is not only do we produce scholarship and make that scholarship known to the community, but we're teaching students. Right? Mm -hmm. um, and um, we had a question earlier today about, you know, how do you get, get majors into an African American studies program where it's uh, a program that still have to meet the kind of metrics that our universities are um, holding us accountable to. So number of majors, number of student credit hours, those kind of things. Um, so what would you say to a student who would say, well, why should I take African American studies classes? Or better yet, to a parent who would say, what kind of job would my student, my child, uh, be prepared for with a degree in African American studies? Mm. Yeah. I mean, I have, I have had parents ask me that. <laughs> um, and so I guess I will say now what I always say to them, which is that, you know, I think black studies as a discipline, as a major, as an area of scholarly inquiry, prepares students in the exact same ways, although around a different set of things, than any other major in the humanity. So if your question is, well, what are they gonna do with that? My question is, well, what are they gonna do with an English major? What are they gonna do with a history major? What are they, you know, what are they gonna do with any of these other majors um, that they might be considering? I think that black studies, in my opinion, in some ways is actually the most practical <laughs> of the majors because it is one that gives people the critical thinking skills um, and applies them in very practical ways <laughs> that people need to be successful thinkers um, in the world. I, it is, it's fascinating to me, and I realize this is not exactly your question, but I feel like it's related because I, I am a little concerned about the direction I think a lot of universities uh, you know, are going, and I think it's a reflection of sort of society at large, mm -hmm. that we imagine that the purpose of the university is to prepare people for jobs. Right, yeah. And that like, universities are no longer about teaching people to think. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, universities now solely exist for the purpose of, let me make sure that you have this degree when you walk out the door so that you can go and get this job. Mm -hmm and that universities become the pathway to allow somebody to be able to go on a particular trajectory and to be able to have a particular lifestyle, right, on the other side. Um, when ultimately I think what we should be existing for as universities and what we should be advocating for as professors is a situation in which we are teaching people how to think critically you know, how to be people who can actually contribute to society, not just, you know, punch a clock and get a particular job, right? But who can actually be thoughtful, meaningful, productive members of society. And so I think that should be the goal of what we're um, producing. And I worry about an educational system that isn't really focused on, let's teach people how to think. <laughs> Um, and I, there's no question in my mind that black studies is a discipline that does that. On my campus, back when I was an undergraduate, back in the 70s, I wasn't at the University of Massachusetts, but at that time, the Commonwealth of Massachusetts state government covered more than two thirds of that university's budget. Tuition was a very small part of the budget. Science research, donations, and other parts of the budget. The state picked up that much. You could go to school in that time. When I, when I graduated University of Texas, um, I owed $2,000 in loans, and I had more than $2,000 in the bank. So I could just pay it out. In fact, when I started getting little nasty letters, I just wrote a check. And, cleared my loans out, I said, to hell with this. So in other words, I graduated debt-free. Mm -hmm. We're not in that world now, right? right? 
And that's where I think a lot of the, what drives a lot of the anxieties that I encounter from students, from parents. And so I have to tell them what it's really about is, okay, that anxiety is worrying you, how much this thing is costing and where, what, what it's, what's gonna happen after you graduate. Let's get a game plan. Let's talk, let's talk shop now. What do you wanna do? What are you passionate about? What do you care about? You know, we're gonna definitely work on the critical thinking. We're gonna work on developing, you know, your life of the mind and being a lifelong learner. That's, that's coming at, I mean, that's happening. But what do you wanna do in three years, in, you know, whenever I'm getting them across, across the desk from me? In two years time, what do you wanna do? Okay, what if you're hurt? Okay, you're a basketball player. Oh, what if you hurt yourself? over there you know, in the tryouts and going for NBA or going for the D League or going for uh, European, you know, uh, playing abroad. What's your fallback with an African American studies degree? What would you fall back and do? You wanna do coaching? Do you work well with young people? Do you, can you inspire them? Can you organize them? Can you give them, you know, develop their drive and, 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 and inspire them to, to get out there and work hard, you know, practicing every day? Is it coaching? Um, do you want to be a teacher? You know, we start talking. You have to get into people. What is, what is it? And get them thinking on their game plan. You know, the, the executive function, I, you know, with my own kids today, I mean, I don't know. But, I mean, I'm 12 years old, and I've got, I've got a game plan. <laughs> you know, I mean, I had my game plan for my life, and I was driven. I was on it. I'm, my major was economics. I thought it just a good, solid undergraduate degree that I'd follow up by going to UT Law School, that I'd follow up by getting in the community, getting involved, and that I'd follow up by running for the U.S. Senate, being the first African-American senator of Texas, state with big electoral college votes, leverage that into being the first black president. And Barack Obama and myself, we're one year apart, okay? So I had the Barack Obama, and if you read, you read his life story, he, had, he, he was on this mission from really early, right? He was very clear. I was very clear. I thought I'd beat Barack, okay? Getting in with Sandy and getting into that life of the mind too much, though, I, I, it drove, and, and politics and stuff, I went off the rails. But, um, and I began to feel like, as someone told me, uh, uh, an activist I worked with in Austin, Miss Dorothy Turner, you know, um, the people who run the country never run for office. So the power really isn't in, I mean, a president can do a lot, you know. And you get those transformative ones who change the discourse and who can, can do a lot. But that really, that office, even as the most powerful office in the world, we'd be in a lot of world of trouble if Trump could do everything he wanted to do. He, he really blows in his mind to do. He can. Too much bureaucracy. He calls it the deep state. He's attacks the bureaucracy now. There's too much. There are too many other forces. International force. It's only so far you can go, even as president of the United. So I began to to to, to peep that a little bit, and I changed my I changed my trajectory. Fell back into that teaching thing that my mother never wanted me to do. But um, but really, you got it. We got to work with our young people. Work on that executive function. Get that game plan a whole lot earlier. And I tell this to my faculty, I tell this, you know, that's part of our, our role these days. If we're gonna work with these young people, inspire them in lifelong learning, inspire them to critical thinkers, inspire, but inspire them as well to think about the game plan. Think about where they wanna be. How did, you know, my thing is visualization. Visualize. What are you doing two years from now? What are you doing? And how do you get there? Let's map it out. So, that, that's important, that's, gonna be, that's important for African Americans, that's important I think for every major, and I think we've, we've got to uh, uh, be, be really clear on that. And then from there you can guide them into things. It's in museums, you're interested in, uh, in teaching, you're interested in um, community service, community organizing, we can start you know, showing them channels of where our majors go and the kinds of things they do but then help them get that game plan, or maybe something else. They may have other things, you know? Um, so let's work with them and do it. Thank you. Uh, so thank you so much. Uh, this has been a, a really um, a enlightening as well as uh, engaging conversation. But I wanna open it up now to the uh, 
<laughs> to the audience. Do, do we have a oh, first question from the dean? From the dean. First, first of all, thank you all for such an enlightening conversation, such a new. I couldn't help but think, uh, Leslie, when you were talking about the interconnection between the academic discipline and the community. Yeah. And also, uh, Amakar, Dr. Shabas, when you were talking about the internationalization of the discipline as a result of the question of, of, Dean, of, Dean, of Dean Fulton, but, but African American studies from its genesis has been international. Yes. Mm -hmm. From mm -hmm. its absolute genesis. Right. Yes. And it couldn't, mm -hmm. I couldn't, it, it brought me back to, I'm gonna put someone on the spot. Um, we are fortunate uh, this semester at the University of Houston to have with us one of the leading scholars in Brazil um, on Afro-Brazilian studies, and she was the first to publish a dissertation in Brazil mm -hmm. relative to an African-American literary scholar. Um, mm -hmm. And so I'm gonna ask Dr. Um, Dr. Cida Salguero, who's sitting in the back. Cida, for those of you who don't know, Cida is a, a living org, she, she can, really weave together how, what you, we've been talking about mm -hmm. and how that manifests in today's context in Brazil. So Dr. Salguero, I hate to put you on the spot, but could you please <laughs> kind of talk a little bit just about what all this rich conversation has been about and how it's manifesting in academic institutions in Brazil and how the community mm -hmm. as Dr. Alexander was talking about um, how, how, how this is happening in Brazil. Let's be honest, we don't really hate to put her on the spot. Because we, <laughs> we want to hear what she has to say. <laughs> so, um, hello everybody. Hi, Hi Jimmy. Um, thank you, Dean Tillis. Um, I mean, I'm speaking out of my emotions at the moment have not uh, thought about this speech. But anyway, uh, there are many, many things that uh, just uh, resonate that we do have in common. And uh, black studies have had uh, a huge importance on, uh, in the country. It's, it's a different genesis, right? It's very different due to uh, racial issues, how they are seen in the U.S. and in Brazil. But anyway, they are very important since we had affirmative action. I mean, the quotas for racial, with the racial uh, specificities in the, at the universities. And that started in 2003. So, I mean, several years after what we're having here but they have been extremely important in the present situation of the country, which I think you all know is very threatening to several gains, several advances, to the university, to knowledge, to science, I mean, to the humanities, of course, as you know and can imagine. But uh, what we understand is that the black students that have been getting access to the universities since 2003 with a few universities. My university, which is Uerge, the State University of Rio de Janeiro, was the first one to have it. And I was part of that fight to, to I mean, implement it with lots of, uh, I mean, uh, people against that when Dr. Shabazz was talking about the 70s when the black studies were being said to disunite the country, what we would hear down there is that uh, we were about to end our so-called beautiful racial democracy, you see? <laughs> that we didn't have a problem in the country and that we were about to create one. So, you know quite well the story and how it goes. So the number of students who have had access to the universities, public universities, I mean, in Brazil, since 2003, are now, I mean, not only they finished uh, their undergraduate studies, but several of them have been, uh, have gone to graduate studies and are at key positions that have been helping in the resistance 
and uh, in the consolidation of institutions uh, that uh, unfortunately they are not so solid as here in the US, you see. So several threatens can be held by those students and those people. And there is something about your talk that touched me in many ways because this is something I believe since the 80s when I started my uh, studies in African-American literature and Afro-Brazilian literature. The intellectuals mentioned uh, the issue that I wrote the first dissertation about a contemporary uh, Afro-Brazilian writer, or black writer, as uh, she would uh, rather be uh, quoted. And uh, so, uh, those students, they, they, uh, they come from different spaces, and uh, we got to reach specific communities that were not reached by academia, by the universities earlier, you see. And they are uh, a great part of our resistance at present. Including, I don't know if you have heard of uh, Marielle Franco, who was, mm -hmm. I mean, uh, tragically murdered almost uh, two years now. Mm -hmm. March the 14th, this will be two years. I mean, she was very close to my university and uh, her sister was my student, so these are forces of power. And also very connected to communities, to gender, sexuality studies, so there are many things that uh, we do have a lot in, in common. And um, thank you, Dean Tillis. I think, uh, I hope uh, part of my talk has reached it, I mean, what, uh, um, you aim at that, it's all, I mean, spontaneous here, but uh, I'll be around until early June. We can have uh, um, some more dialogue. Thank you. Other questions? Yes. Um, hi, I got off work pretty late, so I apologize if by any chance you answered um, my question, um, but also thank you guys for being here. Um, I would like to know if you had any interactions with a parent or a student or anyone recently that reaffirmed or even reignited um, your decision to be a professor in African American studies um, and or the work that you're doing around that. Well, I'll tell this story. Um, I was in Brazil for a different purpose, and um, they learned about my research, the, the um, work on desegregation of higher education, the Advancing Democracy book. And, um, and so some folks came to uh, liberate me from my hotel, to take me to, uh, into the community, Ponte Pequena in Sao Paulo. And um, it was to meet with people with the uh, Facultad Zumidos Palmares. Um, it had just been established in 2004. I was there in 2005. And this is the equivalent of what we would call a historically black college or university. So the very first HBCU in Brazil is set up in 2004. There's no black university before then. There's no black higher education before then, okay? So the very first one. So they brought me out to meet the, 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 the rector and to meet with faculty there. And, um, and so it really reaffirmed for me, you know, what I was doing. And, and um, the, um, I met with the leader of a, of a movement organization called Afro Brass, uh, Jose Vincenti. And uh, he told me what was driving him and many others to try to set up this, I'm calling it HBCU in, 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 Brazil, in Brazil. But here's the thing, they started being attacked, just as you said, that we were importing the American problems of race into Brazil, that all this mess 
from the United States of HBCUs and affirmative action and doing things to supposedly, you know, lift black people in spite of the bell curve, we were now bringing this mess to Brazil, which had no history of that and no problems. <laughs> Mind you, <laughs> it's higher ed degrees, African Americans, African Americans with law degrees, African American with medical, what, like 1% or less than 1%? Much less than 1% what with degrees. If you, if, you, if you allow me, at the time, less than 1% of the population, and I'm not racializing it, had a, uh, a higher degree than And this is in a country where, how would you number the number of people of African descent in Brazil? Nowadays, self-declared, 53%. Mm. Half the country but less than 1% with any kind of degrees, advanced degrees, doctorates and whatnot, forget it. <laughs> you know, you can't, off the scale. And so the idea that you get all this pushback for trying to create an institution like Facultad Zumidos Palmares, which all that they, all they did is, is that by charter, by their charter, 50% plus one of every admission had to be someone who self-identified as Afro-Brazilian. They didn't say no white people can go here. They just said, or white Brazilians, but at least we're targeting for 50% plus one to be of African descent. And they offered four degrees at that time. And most of them were in business kind of areas, tourism and whatnot, because that was a big part of the concern. Every year, Jose Vincenti was, every year we have Carnival. And you know, everybody gets out and he says, the whole rhythm of Carnival comes from a little area in Bahia of black people would kind of set the rhythm. And everybody would be dancing and it's so great and from black culture. And but the only thing for black people is to push the floats. The black Brazilian, but the only kind of role for them, you know, other than the, to, to be part of the color and the party and what, you, you don't see them in a business capacity. You don't see them making real, you know, some of the money out of it. So that was part of where they set up the, their degrees and hospitality management in some different areas. But again, all this enormous pushback was coming against them for this very, very modest effort in trying to enlarge the inclusivity of Afro-Brazilians in Brazilian higher education. It was just ridiculous. So for me, that was a very affirming experience to go and to be a part of that in Sao Paulo and, and whatnot. So that's what comes to mind just off of that. <laughs> Honestly, my, my response is probably gonna sound a little corny. <laughs> <laughs> but the truth is, I feel like I have an experience, at least one, in every single class period that I have mm -hmm. that makes me feel like this is why I'm doing this. Yeah. Yeah. You know, um, and it ranges. I mean, sometimes it's a student who is having that light bulb moment mm. of like, what? You know, and I see it like go on and I'm like, okay, like I'm doing this right. <laughs> um, so, you know, sometimes it's something like that. Um, sometimes it's a student who comes up after class and approaches me and says, I feel like you're the only professor I can talk to about this. And sometimes it's an academic question, sometimes it's not. Sometimes it's a personal struggle um, that they're having in their lives. But they're a student of color and I'm a black professor and they feel like I'm the only person they can talk to. Mm -hmm. um, Mm. And so, yeah, it's those types of moments, you know, that make me feel like that's why I'm doing this and that's why um, I continue to do this and that's why I'm going to continue to fight this fight, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. um, to keep black studies alive. Um, so, I mean, literally, it's pretty much every single time. Like, I set foot in a classroom. <laughs> mm -hmm. I have an experience that makes me feel like it's actually important, you know, that we keep showing up um, and, and doing this work. Um, if you want like a sort of a very specific example, um, one was actually recently when 
I was invited to spend a week at another university, you know, interacting with their students and giving talks on my research and that kind of thing. And I went to a class that um, historians, I'm gonna be honest, sometimes I'm a bad historian. Sometimes I'm a, I'm a better black studies person than I am a historian. <laughs> So there's this one class that historians love to teach, which is called the historian's craft. Mm -hmm. And honestly, sometimes for me, it's kind of a snooze. But, um, <laughs> but it's a course that's supposed to be all about introducing people to how we do history. And it's just a class that can be done well and a class that can be done like a little snoozy. Um, but this particular class was was not a snoozy one. It was, you know, it had and it had an approach that was really encouraging young people to start thinking about themselves as potential historians. And so they asked me, you know, as sort of the guest person to talk about my journey to how I became a historian. And I told a, a much longer and more in depth than sort of fraught <laughs> story um, along the lines of, of what we opened with, sort of about what that process was like for me. Um, and the students just went nuts. Like I was thinking, I'm gonna say this, you know, this is a, an hour class and they want me to talk for like 15 minutes and then what are we supposed to do for the rest of the time? Mm -hmm. And the students went nuts. And afterwards, I got mobbed by the students of color outside the class. Mm -hmm. Um, who were like, oh my gosh, and what, and tell me more. And, you know, they were like um, so turned on by the idea that there could be a person of color standing in front of that room who was a professor who had had an experience that sounded like theirs, you know, who hadn't understood really what college was all about before they came in, you know, that had struggled financially all the way through, that had never envisioned or imagined themselves as becoming a professor. And so that experience really resonated for me and was an important reminder that like, yeah, it actually is important that we keep showing up and we keep bringing our black faces into these classrooms, you know, and inspiring, you know, reminding you know, um, and proving, right, that this is actually something that we can be and do. Right, right. Um, so I s said earlier how I decided to go into administration because I felt like I would have a greater impact mm -hmm. on the institution. Um, I really love teaching and doing my scholarship. But at some point, I realized that I wasn't going to be the next Bell Hooks. <laughs> so I you know, really thought, well, I'll have this greater impact. Um, and still try to keep my foot in scholarship sometime, but it's hard as an administrator. But recently, I think back in um, November at Rice University, there was a symposium on um, black women in uh, the, the um, international com uh, context and uh, particularly in the Caribbean. And so during lunch, I just sat down with a young woman and um, introduced myself and she's like, oh wow, I, use, I just use your book, right? Uh, and, and that was, for me, I was just like, oh, okay, you know, people still read my work, right? Um, but it's that kind of um, connection with whether it's scholars or sometimes, recently I got an email from a student that I had over 15 years ago at Arizona State who said, oh, you know, Dr. Fulton, I just want to touch base with you. I was thinking about Invisible Man and what we talked yeah. about and everything, and, you know, uh, which I didn't really remember the conversation, <laughs> but that was really nice, right? Um, that you still have this impact or know that you have this impact mm -hmm. years later. Um, but I think for me, the quintessential moment for, you know, I know I'm doing the right thing is uh, I, was at, you know, I was a faculty member at the University of Memphis and I, uh, one of the classes that I had, I think it was um, African American novel or something like that. And I had a student come up to me and say, 
uh, Dr. Fulton, I'm registered for both your classes this term, and I want to be just like you, so what can I read or tell me what to do, right? So, you know, I said, well, first, you don't want to be like me, right? Um, you want to be better. And, um, and I began working with her, learned her story. Oh, my goodness, she had such a, a, a rich story and has taken the education that she, she ended up getting a degree in anthropology. She, uh, she was a um, aged out foster child, right? And so what she's, she's taken that work in, in education in African American studies and um, works with community organizations, with um, foster care uh, organizations, and has really made a great impact and, and, and lives in um, Atlanta right now. And we still remain in contact 20 years later. And um, that's the kind of thing, right, that says to me, okay, you know, mm -hmm. you're doing the right thing because you're making an impact on people changing lives and even your scholarship making an impact as well. Mm -hmm. yeah. So are we out of time? We're, 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 all right. <laughs> um, first of all, we want to thank you again for being here and we'd like to invite you to continue the conversation, um, at least for those of you who are not undergraduate students under 21 years of age. Uh, we would like to invite you to join us, um, thanks to Dean Tillis, in the Honors Commons right across the lobby for a little reception. Uh, so you can continue visiting with our esteemed panelists. I want to thank you all for coming and joining us for the enlightened conversation. It was wonderful. And we actually have uh, a little thank you, a little something from the College of Liberal Arts and Social Sciences to show you our appreciation you. for you everything so you've done today. Thank, Thank you. you. <laughs>